Today's episode is brought to you by FRW Studios, a damn fine design studio as fresh and authentic as the beer you brew. FRW Studios has created killer can designs for dozens of brewers we love, including The Lost Abbey, The Hop Concept, Port Brewing, and so many other craft favorites. Creative director Julie White has happened to design the 15th anniversary Stone Brewing's book, as well as over 20 books for the Brewers Association. In fact, the Brewers Association says Julie is authentic, creative, reliable, and hands down one of the best graphic designers they've worked with. So send them your brand and they'll send you back an original design that fits it or takes it to the next level, if that's what you're into. Hop on over to unitedwedrink.com slash FRW Studios to see what the buzz is about. And while you're at it, download FRW's Crash Course in Branding for tips and tricks of the trade. Everyone who downloads the PDF will automatically qualify for a chance to win a custom design for your next project. Now that's something to drink about. You make the beer taste good. FRW Studios makes it look good. The opinions and statements in this podcast do not represent those of the hosts, employers, co-workers, family, or imaginary friends. Now enjoy the show. Happy hour? More like amateur hour. Welcome to United We Drink. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the podcast that does not cure the common cold, but is recommended for treatment. Welcome to United We Drink, right here on unitedwedrink.com, as well as Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, and wherever fine podcasts are found. I should also say that that is not medical advice. My name is Mike Urevich, a podcaster extraordinaire in my own mind, and I am joined by my two cohorts of the show. First up is a man who once believed that Movember was more of a manscaping thing. Here's Phil Palmasano. <laughs> it, it, it was weird. I didn't get a lot of donations that year, so I just <laughs> ended up shaving my face the next year. As for my other co-host, some say that he is capable of harnessing negative emotions to turn into gasoline, and that he was once banned from an Arby's for trying to pay in uneaten Wendy's. All I know is he's called Joel Codner. Well, thank you, Mike. And I would agree with the first part of that. Uh, but the second part, there is no such thing as uneaten Wendy's. <laughs> uh, thank you, everyone who continues to listen to the show, despite uh, all these weird random introductions. Um, before we get into the main show, gentlemen, what are we drinking tonight, Phil? Phil? I am drinking a uh, my last can of After Sesh from Cigar City Brewing Company. It's a uh, it's an ale with orange lime and salt. It's quite refreshing. Look forward to the fresh batch next year. Hey, I'm drinking uh, Cigar City as well tonight. I'm having Wedge Cut, an American wheat ale with lemon peel and lemon drop hops. I like that one. It's very nice. Also, apologies for any sound that might be coming across that's a little crazy. Uh, that is my puppy who does not like being in a room. Uh, Joel, Mike what are you drinking? Mike just has a child locked in a room in the background. <laughs> Joel, what about you? I am drinking, I've got a double of Jameson right here, and I also have 2019 Celebration from Sierra Nevada. Quite the. I've been looking for it, and I can't find it anywhere yet. It was tough. I was really on the hunt yesterday. Fortunately, I found it at the uh, brand new ABC by me. Uh, quite the ironic beer to be drinking because I don't think there's fucking anything to celebrate about 2019. Way to be a downer. Uh, You're welcome. You know, our show restarted. I started working for you. Nothing to celebrate. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> with that, let's get into talking about some news. Phil? All right, I promised that we would talk about seltzer this week. So, um, gentlemen, no, uh, this is actually more, I'm going to pose this as more of a question, and then we can talk about it as news. No beer style, and keep in mind, F&Bs are within that beer, quote-unquote, beer style. 
has popped Liar. up on more menus in the past year than blank. Who wants to guess first? Popeye's chicken sandwiches? Mm, no, not a beer <laughs> style. New England IPAs. This style of it, it, it's popping up on more menus across the United States within the on premise than even seltzers. Mike, I I gotta go to you first because I know you're just you're a seltzer hater. True. Are you happy to see this, or do you think do you think that this is going to change in the future because of the increased awareness and popularity of my favorite bubbly clear liquid? I it doesn't surprise me that New England IPA is this. I mean, uh, IPA in general seemed to be on the rise a few years ago uh, before this kind of subgenre came about you started seeing at least I, i'm not going by iri data or anything like that but just experience seeing more places having ipas uh more ipas on shelves in grocery and chain uh type of stores um so it's not surprising that the less bitter alternative to the ipa has uh popped up into this as well i would also like to say that I had one of those canned uh, mixed drinks this past week. That is what I expect a hard seltzer to taste like, by the way. What brand? Uh, I don't remember. It was something out of uh, San Diego. Cool. Uh, but it was a, a vodka and uh, cranberry. No, vodka, grapefruit, soda. It was super refreshing. Wish I remember the name, but anyway, it doesn't it doesn't surprise me that the whole New England IPA thing has uh, been popping up more and more on menus. I agree with Mike. I'm not surprised at all. I'm glad to see more New England style phrasing. Everyone couldn't decide between juicy New England, Northeast, Northeast style. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm. I was very put off by the style in the beginning, being the old curmudgeon that I am, but. I've warmed up to it and have even made a few at the brewery that we really enjoyed. Um, I still don't know why haze is a positive attribute. No one can tell me that. I do like that it has leaned toward less bitter, softer, easier drinking. Uh, everybody can get lost with that pillowy bullshit. As long as it doesn't have lactose, vanilla, or any of that nonsense, uh, I, I'm, I'm good with it. I think it's interesting, honestly. I mean, it, Mike, you na hit the nail on the head when you said IPAs are st they're growing, or a few years ago they were growing. They still are. Um, they're the number one uh, beer category. And when you look at another area that is growing rapidly right now are high alcohol beverages, which high alcohol beers typically are going to be in that double IPA hazy area. Um, not surprised that New England IPAs or New England style IPAs are popping up on more menus. I, I am somewhat surprised that seltzer, unfortunately, is not pulling up on more on-premise menus. And that's simply just looking at the net share. So New England style IPAs are only a 0.4% share of the entire craft beer segment where seltzer right now is still, it's a small segment. It's only 3.6%, but it's still growing rapidly. Um, I I personally believe we're going to see more seltzer on menus by call. So be it White Claw Lime or Truly Passion Fruit or Wild Basin, uh, Yum Berry in the, in the future. Um, I, I really do believe that seltzer is not... Uh, going to slow down at any point in time is draft seltzer a thing it mm -hmm. is yeah we talked about that a few episodes ago uh truly truly white claw have both released clear or pure draft seltzer um oh as so those the non-flavored ones okay. correct yes um so, and but are I have any of the flavored rumors. ones so Wild Basin has a lime and blackberry raz out. Uh, MIA, and uh, based out of Miami, uh, they have several draft flavors. 
And we're starting to see other seltzer companies come out and try and compete within that draft segment. I personally haven't seen too much of it in on-premise accounts. And I think some of that just goes back to there's a status symbol with those slimline white cans, in my opinion. I think people want to be seen drinking those slimline cans in the on-premise in particular. And they, uh, Sorry. No, go. I, I was going to ask, what do you guys think? So you think that they, they don't want to cannibalize this branding and this identity that they've created by making draft? They, they think like people like they, they see this can and they n- associate it with that brand. So therefore, it would be silly for them to take draft and eliminate that look. I, I, mm, no, I, I think. Makes sense, though. No, it, it and it does make sense. And and think about it just from a standard consumption area. It, would you rather your beer poured into a clear pint glass or someone walking around with a sixteen ounce can of Brand X? Oh yeah, it's advertising I, too. Yeah, a can is definitely advertising. And so I think you get the best of both worlds, with the exception of the volume, because that's that ultimately that's what we're talking about is volume when you talk about draft. Is it a better price per ounce for the bars? Absolutely it is. But the average consumer is looking for that slimline white can and not necessarily for seltzer on draft right now. I I think that will change. I think there will be some cannibalization of, excuse me, um, lines. But I don't, there's so many people fighting for the same draft lines right now, be it a wine company, a uh, RTD cocktail, uh, ready to draft, if you want to call it that. Even craft beer, and then you have big beer coming in and trying to eat up within their own portfolios with uh, pseudo craft beer. It draft lines are pretty limited. I, I don't know. I I think you'll probably see one or two seltzers on, almost like a nitro line, until you get your seltzer bars, right? Oh, and then nitro seltzer! Like, Man, that's a field trip coming, right? I'm waiting to see a big old yard of seltzer. (laughs) 50 lines. I I did see someone talking about draft uh, White Claw today, the pure flavor, if that's what you want to call it. Uh, And I I don't remember where this was or who was talking about it. I saw it randomly on Twitter earlier, but uh, they were even talking about using it as sort of a mixer, Um, you know, throwing whatever else in there, craft cocktails, if you will. Yeah, that's how... The companies right now are going out that, hey, replace your soda water with a 4.5% soda water, 5% soda water, and then add a twist of lime, twist of lemon, and boom, you're done. It's I quick. feel like that would be a hard sell on a bar because soda water just comes through a gun uh, at most of these bars, and it's so much cheaper than taking away a draft line and putting something else on there, buying a keg, having to deal with all of that stuff, as opposed to just having, a, a, like I said, a gun on that almost all of these places have. Well, think about it. If you want a vodka soda in a account that does not carry a liquor license, now all of a sudden you can have a pseudo vodka soda, correct? You can't call that vodka soda. It's not vodka. Well, but it tastes similar. You shouldn't taste vodka, right? You you should taste burning. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're moving on. Speaking of alcohol, though, good transition, Mike. Um, You're welcome. <laughs> Lagavulin and Nick Offerman um, are, are rekindling their relationship and friendship and showing the world how much they love each other by releasing a lev- an 11 year old aged scotch. My question to you guys, are celebrity-endorsed beverages inf- influencing your purchasing decisions, and do you feel that this will continue? Celebrity, <laughs> I hate the whole celebrity influencing. I, you have people out there who literally do nothing, and they've become billionaires. Kardashians! Um, and, I mean, we talked about the Jonas Brothers weeks ago with whatever that was, and obviously they're not going to make me go buy whatever they were hawking. Um, Coors Light. Right. And, I mean, I already drink that anyway. I don't need those whatevers to tell me. Uh, Anyway, so I like Nick Offerman. I love the whole Ron Swanson character. I know Mike does as well. 
I don't think it's still going to influence me to buy a bottle of scotch, but I would probably lean more toward his brand or whatever he's putting out than someone I like less. Um, I don't know. I, I like scotch anyway. I'd be open to trying it. It's, it's probably something I would like to see them, you know, doing a little sampling of if they're out promoting it somewhere. I'd definitely try it. I don't know if it's going to automatically just make me buy it because Nick Offerman's attached to it, but um, I, I think it's it's definitely a trend that's continuing. I mean, every brand has to figure out a way to stand out. So I think we're going to be seeing a lot more celebrities being attached to these things. Uh, I, I pretty much agree with what Joel is saying on a whole. Uh, celebrity endorsements by themselves do not influence my purchasing decision. Uh, but this one kind of does because I I do love Nick Offerman and I love the Ron Swanson character and this is just like a match made in heaven because Nick Offerman the person and Ron Swanson the character were both very big lovers of Lagavulin uh, Scotch whiskeys. I myself am a big fan. I still have a little bit of uh, Lagavulin 16 still that I like I almost feel like I can't just drink the rest of it because then it'll be gone. Um, so I probably will splurge on a bottle of this if I see it. And at a $75 suggested retail price, I think that that's a pretty good price for a fine uh, scotch. And, and this is, of Lagavulin is known as being a very peaty scotch as well. That is a thing that I like. I like the eyelays. So... I'll, I I will say that his endorsement on this will probably cause me to buy a bottle, but uh, most of the time those things don't matter to me. Does the trend continue? Of course it will. There are always going to be endorsements. Is that a seventy five dollars seven fifty? Yeah. Okay. At least that's what uh, I mean. It doesn't say a a size on the article, but I'm assuming it is. Yeah, I would imagine it would have to be the. And, and the price, I was surprised at the price point, personally. 16 is over $100, so yeah. th- th- it makes a little sense for the year-wise. Have either of you watched the Yule Log where he yeah. goes through oh, the yeah. bottle? Yeah. So we watch it at my house every year. We actually put our Christmas tree up tonight because we want to be early on this whole Christmas thing, um, which I'm sure you know, I'll get cursed at some point in time for it. As long as it's after Halloween, I'm fine I, with it. it. That's how I look at it. I love this. It, first of all, it's a reputable brand, right? We're yeah. not talking about some sure. you know, fly-by-night company that's like, oh, we're going to start and we're going to sign Ryan Reynolds to our ownership board so that we can talk about Aviation Gin and Ryan Reynolds can go out and plug it. And I have bought Aviation Gin because I like Ryan Reynolds. And I didn't I know that he, he was an endorser on that. Yep, he's all good over gin. the place with it. Oh, very good gin. And so when and Casamigos with uh, George Clooney and I, it that actually deterred me. And then I tried Casamigos and I'm like, shit, this is actually a really good tequila. When you look at something like this, you have a very reputable brand coming together to collaborate. And I use air quotes on that with someone that I love as a character and I think is a very interesting individual. I will more than likely splurge the $75 on my next bottle of scotch to be this if I can find it because it's either that or I'm just going to fall back to my normal $50 or $60 bottle of scotch that I go through for the holidays and it lasts me a year. So I'll probably do that. Um, As for will it continue, yeah, it's going to always continue. And I, I think some of these, you see passion and and the the ones that I like are the ones that you see the passion behind versus the ones that you're like, oh, well, that's a clear cash grab um, on behalf of the actual endorser. Um, so, but yeah, that's my that's take. That's exactly what I was just going to say, Phil. I was going to ask if you guys had tried that Dan Aykroyd vodka. Crystal Skull. Oh, yeah, yeah, Crystal Skull. Yeah, that's yeah, not yeah. just an you know what it tastes That is like? actually his company. Well, right, and that was going to be it my point. It tastes like vodka. That... It tastes like nothing. Like... <laughs> it tastes like burning. It tastes like seltzer. Um, <laughs> no, but 
when you hear him talk about that brand, and obviously he's an owner and he's got to be sort of his own salesperson in a way, um, he's so passionate and so knowledgeable and so informed about the ingredients, the process, the whole deal. So that turns me on a lot more than just seeing a celebrity's face slapped on something. If I can tell that they're truly involved and had input on the development and creation and marketing and everything, I just I find more authenticity in it. And that's what I would rather gravitate toward rather than just, you know, seeing their face slapped on a box or a commercial. Yeah, yeah I agree. And I that's sort of how I view the Ryan Reynolds aviation gen thing. So um Last bit of news, and we've spent a lot of time on news tonight, but this one, we have to talk about it. Brewer Molson Coors uh, is set to cut 500 jobs in January, move their North American headquarters from Denver to Chicago, and they're going to change the name of Molson Coors Brewing Company to Molson Coors Beverage Company. Again, all of this goes live in January. I'm interested in your take on this. I mean, this. I guess this is a a tale of the sign of the times of uh, what we're going through with that name change, at least. Um, as for laying off people, and that it fucking sucks. Uh, but I, I, I don't know how. Like, I have no knowledge of what the inner workings of of Molson Coors is to know what really went behind this decision but i feel for the people who lost their jobs and uh but is it i don't know it's it's a it's a i don't know it, it, i i don't really know what else to say in regards to that I, I that sounds terrible and like a cop out but whatever uh I'm Joel. the same way. I, I'm I'm way too ignorant when it comes to the business side, especially especially when you consider the, the size of Molson Coors and just the global reach. I mean, it's I, I go to larger craft breweries and the size and scale is unfathomable. I mean, so to you know the motivations. I mean, they're they're obviously responsible to shareholders, correct? I mean, you know they have to do what they have to do. It fucking kills me that you know this stuff sort of always goes on right at the end of the year. And hundreds of people lose their jobs right before the holidays. I have to imagine that it'll be easy to find work. I mean, I've always said that the industry is sorely lacking experienced, knowledgeable people, or, or rather the industry is outgrowing the availability of those people. So I hope they land on their feet. Yeah, I think it's the timing isn't odd, obviously, because we are coming to the end of the year and this is typically when all of this stuff happens. Uh, cutting the 500 jobs sucks, plain and simple. Hopefully a majority of those people, can. Uh, hopefully everyone can find their way back on their feet in a very timely manner or have something lined up when the transition actually happens. Uh, the one thing that uh, moving from Denver to Chicago doesn't bother me nearly as much as I find it very interesting that the name of the company is moving from Molson Coors Brewing Company to Molson Coors Beverage Company. And this is a true sign that Seltzer and other F&Bs outside of the brewing industry, be it, other beverages, not F&Bs, uh, kombuchas, teas, coffees, uh, sodas, everything that falls under beverage is where now, large companies are starting to look because they're seeing the industry as a whole really starting to soften. So I'm, I, I was very intrigued by it. And it's funny because the probably the least important thing to a majority of people was something that caught most of my attention. That is all. All right. So our main topic tonight, we're going to talk about... Uh, consumption uh, of of beers and responsible consumption at that when you get into this industry i think that uh probably a lot of uh, all three of us at some point were like shit yeah we get to we get to have beer uh and a lot more than we typically do for probably cheaper and now being people who've been in this industry for probably 
getting some of us close to a decade. Phil, you've you've been in this industry longer than uh, both of us. Um, you you learn things and you uh, understand that just going to an event and uh, slamming a bunch of beers is not a thing that you want to do for your health, for your reputation, for your job. Um, so there's a lot of, a lot of stuff that can come into play when talking about the responsible consumption of beer. Um, I'll start with, with Phil here because you are the one who has been in here in this industry, the longest out of us. Um, was there an early on phase where you learned this? Uh, was it through an experience or was it, was it someone told you, like maybe someone pulled you aside and like, Hey, blah, blah, blah. Um, did, did, or were you like pretty much always thinking like, Hey, my, my job depends on this. I should, uh, probably take it easy. Your job always depends on this. So, I remember sitting down for my initial interview with Cigar City Brewing Company back in, God, it was probably 2000, end of 2010, 2011. And we, everybody was spitballing at that point in time. It was Joey, uh, Justin, myself. And, and we went back and forth. And I remember one of the two of them said, Hey, this is a really fun industry. You get to drink, you get to drink beer, you get to go out to events. You get to have fun, but you have to be responsible because you have to be able to drive a car. And I, I think I talked about that in a previous episode where it's like, you get a DUI and you're sort of SOL. That stuck with me all the way through. Now, was I cognizant on it? There were definitely some nights that I, probably a handful of beers, you know, gave me a little bit more courage to get behind the wheel than I probably should have. Um, as for keeping that in mind and, and continuing to grow, I think that over time, first of all, that the, the sort of gleam of that new car wore off. And so after a while, it was like, man, I'm not, you know, gone out i've done five events in five days i'm exhausted i've stayed up till two o'clock in the morning i'm up at 9 a.m or at, at that point in time i was waking up at 5 a.m working out every day and sweating out the booze and and i'm back at work at eight nine o'clock the next morning and i'm working again till 11 or 12 and i'm up till two and i'm eating like garbage and i'm overindulging and at some point in time, it just catches up after a month or two, and you're like, man, I'm, I'm sort of bearded out. And then you go to wine, or you go to cocktails, or you go to seltzers. Um, and <laughs> it at, at some point in time, you just get to the point where it's like, you know what? I need water. I need a salad. And you find balance. Now, for me in particular, as I continue to grow and mature throughout the industry and take different positions, I had to I didn't have to I'll, I'll take that back I decided that it was better for me to drink less in front of my peers and out at events and be able to hold myself to a higher standard and I always push myself to be a higher standard the breaking point of that entire situation and really what sort of like pushed me off the edge was my now wife at one point in time came to me and said, hey, I love the fact that you're happy. I love what you do. I need you to stop drinking so much and driving um, or u even Ubering because you're coming home super late. Can instead of staying for seven or six. And by the way, the Mayo Clinic actually states that anything more than four drinks a day or 14 drinks per week designates you as an alcoholic. And I, I mean, I know for a fact I don't have a dependency problem, but if I am going to go to an event or something of that nature, more than likely I'm going to have, you know, two, three, four beers easy. Um, definitely 14 beers a week or something like that on like a week that I'm traveling is not unheard of. But when it came back to my family life being sort of pushed to the limit, that's when I had to turn back around and say, you know what, this makes sense. From now on, it's one beer 
nurse it, maybe two beers, nurse it, Uber home. Uh, if I'm out uh, out of town, uh, you know, look at it the same way. Make sure that I'm eating because that was one thing that I never did when I started was who cared about eating? I, I had, you know, malt, hops, and water for dinner. Um, and there's enough nutrients in beer to sustain me and push me through. No, that has to end. Like, uh, you have to eat food. Um, so that's sort of my story. Sorry for getting long-winded. No, not at all. A handful I, of years in this industry. That I think that that is super important to hear. And um, I, I never knew about this, the Mayo Clinic uh, information on that. And that that it's it's scary and, and enlightening at the same time. And um, hey, does, have you heard of that before, Joel? I haven't heard or... that statistic. I have heard of the Mayo Clinic. I, I would assume you hadn't because you hate Mayo. But uh, <laughs> uh, no, I, I hadn't heard that statistic. And to me, it, yeah, that does sound like a lot of drinks. And it depends person to person. I mean, there are some very functional alcoholics. And then there are some people who are just drop down sloppy after one. So to have a sort of blanket statistic like that you know i don't know where any of that information is gleaned from but um it almost feels like the bmi thing like you can you can look totally fine but if you're a certain height and weight you're over like obese and well it doesn't obviously necessarily... i you're talking about weight you're talking about stress you're talking about um what you've eaten for the day all of those things play into how alcohol is going to interact with your body yeah specifically within that 24 hour period and you know that said i'm i'm 6'3 240 230 pounds uh, i think i can handle four drinks a day it, specifically if i'm spacing the bmi out probably within. says you're obese right oh yeah absolutely i am i'm i'm 6'1 195 and i'm considered obese fat pieces of shit <laughs> <laughs> Um, Something uh, in there about a pot calling a kettle black. Oh yeah, I thank know. Christ I'm this to is not. It out. <laughs> yeah, glad we don't upload the video. <laughs> uh, so, like, Joel, what about your own experience with with things like this? Uh, was uh, was there anything that made you decide, hey, my my, con or were you always feeling like, oh, I'm I'm fine with all this. I I know I need to watch uh, my consumption levels and anything like that? Or was there a moment that uh, that tipped you off that uh, like, ooh, I need to change some of this stuff? Well, I talked about that moment on our work-life balance episode, and it sounds very much like Phil's story. So I don't want to rehash it if, you know, listeners have already heard that story. But what I will say is that not only is it, you know, you know more the longer you're in the industry, it's also just an aging and maturity thing. It seems like we were just drinking tons early on and now we're able to moderate ourselves a bit better for me now i have such a long drive home from work that for me to sit at the bar and over consume i mean it's just a stupid idea and i don't even fathom it i may have a couple and then sit around for a bit um i'll definitely try to eat something with it um i you know in the beginning i was also taking tri-rail every day. So I didn't have to worry about driving. So I was definitely overindulging. There were times where I would even take a to-go cup and go run and catch the train with it. You know, I mean, I, would, I, I specifically recall one night where I was drinking so much scotch ale that I took one to go and I'm walking with it with a plastic cup, like down the back, you know, ways of, you know, getting to the train tracks. And then I hear like, choo-choo, like I hear the train and I'm like, oh shit. And I start hauling ass with this cup in my hand and I'm like, fuck, I'm spilling it everywhere. And I just pounded it mid stride and hauled ass for the train to catch it. I mean, that was, that was a, it's funny, but it's like a horrible moment when you really think about like how much you're really drinking. And, uh, you know, like Phil, I, I got the talking to, um, and it, it's, 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 it's maturity thing. It, it's a, a mindfulness thing. It, it's, there's so many facets to it. And, you know, I, like I get, I hate to be like the old curmudgeon and, and get off my lawn guy, but sometimes I'll see chug culture, you know, where people are just so dumb, 
standing yeah. in a you know a bar is promoting it like come chug one and then you've got 14 people standing in a circle chugging 12 percent imperial stout and it's like yeah we you know we can all go out and have fun we've done um what the fuck do they call it um shotgunning like yeah. i've 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 shotgun 10 fitty before like i'm not saying i've never done all it. all three of things. us have done that it's yes. actually really on that good beer. shotgun it is <laughs> <laughs> but, so um, you know, f- like I always say, for an industry that purports itself to be highly ethical and moral high ground and all that, you see a lot of irresponsibility, whether it's safety, overconsumption, all these things. And, you know, I would just, if I could give anybody, you know, one message, it would just be to try to be mindful about what you're doing. I mean, we know people that we've lost to overconsumption and driving, and it's it's horrible. And I don't want to see that again. And and it's that's a really bad byproduct of it. And it, you brought up the to go cup. I think we right now uh, at whatever time you're listening to this on whatever day, stop getting to go cups. To go cups are the devil. I remember back in like 2012, I had an account in South Florida that used to do Tim Fitty with a floater of makers. In a oh. soup container cup. So <laughs> this is how you know it's an industry place. Soup container cup, not the small one, the big one, and then jab a straw through it and allow you to walk around the street with it. What the hell? And How is I, that even legal in most it, uh, places? It isn't. It's not. It isn't, yeah. but I, I loved it. It was great. <laughs> uh, the, the and ma- makers and Tim Fitty do taste good. Sorry, Mike. The maturity thing and the age thing, uh, I, I I think Joel brought up, uh, is super important. I think that all three of us can probably, uh, within a few seconds, think of someone who you either have worked with or a peer in the industry that you saw at an event just getting obliterated and was like, "Dude, what are you doing? Like, you like you're representing this company and you're making yourself look like an ass." Like, get your shit together. That was oh. me. I mean, there, there's a beer named after me at our last brewery because of one <laughs> infamous night where every bar we went to, I had a double scotch, and then I was, like, finishing other people's drinks, and then I just, you know, blacked out, desecrated a local monument, uh, got lost. Nobody could find me. It, it was pretty bad. I mean, I'm you not You didn't get that. lost. You were exactly where you were supposed to be, and someone missaw you. Adam. <laughs> yeah, I, it's it's not good, man. I mean, I, there are some nights where I, I recall and I'm just like, Jesus Christ, what, like, why? Why did I do any of that? And it's hard when you're with other people. You know, there's peer pressure that you try not to succumb to. It's, oh, we'll have one more, you know, we'll go to this other place. And it's like, holy shit, like, you know, some people can handle it better than others. I realistically don't. And it's been a long time since I've been hung over. It's been a long time since I've drank too much and thrown up. I mean, I thank, uh, well, I probably shouldn't even mention anything about other products available on the market these days. But uh, I tend to lean toward those uh, more than alcohol lately. I think it's important to state that Every industry, you get to go out and you get to have fun. You get to cut loose. Everyone wants to have those crazy nights. It's when these become the norm that this is the issue. And we're in an industry, obviously, with alcohol. We have a lot of fun nights, be it wherever or in our home hometown. But ultimately, if this is impacting your personal life or your professional life, you might want to seek help. Um, and, and that's not to take this podcast in a different direction because it's a lot of fun. Uh, I, I love this industry. I love being able to walk into a bar and talk to somebody behind the bar, but at the same time, you have to know your limitations. And I shared a story a few podcasts ago in regards to my, um, lack of, I guess, strength to say no to a drink in the past where now I'm, I'm happy to just honestly say, Hey, I'm, you know, I'm just not drinking or I've had that already. Thanks so much for the offer. Yeah. And sometimes there is like, 
you, you got to be very confident in yourself and saying no to something like that, because there are going to be people who will be like, well, oh, come on, really? I'm, I'm offering you a drink. And and because maybe they've had a few, they they almost feel quasi insulted if you turn them down in those situations. But it's 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 a matter of being strong. I like I, I know for a fact one of one of our mutual friends who's a brewery rep uh, at points like I've been to events with him. He's like, I'll buy you a drink. I'm like, nah, dude, I'm I'm good, but thank you. And he's like, oh, come on, I'm having another. I'm like, no, nah, I'm I'm good, thank you. Like, he's like, I'm offering you a free drink. I'm like, and I appreciate that. Uh, but it's just, it's not. It can be difficult, and I I know for myself, you guys have all talked about your your specific moments. I mean, I can I can remember things early on where I would go to the brewery. Uh, that I was working at on days off or hang around after I I was I was done and just uh, drink hang out with the the regulars bullshit with them bullshit with the with the uh, bartending staff hang out after uh, hours with them and it's like I look back at that and I'm like God like I yeah I was in my my own brewery but I'm sure I probably said or fucking did something that was kind of dumb and fucked up. And there I was being a representative of the brewery. I mean, there's been some CBCs where uh, things get a little, a little crazy Um, from time to time. Joel's been there with seeing me do some of them. Phil, you have Kevin, our, our friend of the show has seen me in uh, certain situations at CBCs, Denver, one of them. Um, but yeah, there, there became a point and I don't really recall a, a, a tipping point, so to speak, but it was like, I want this to be my career. I want this to be my life. And I need to probably be a little better, uh, with my consumption and my ability to say no to, to the nice things that people will be like, Hey, you want to have another beer? And like, nah, I should probably be heading home. And, and holy shit. Phil, you mentioned ride sharing with Uber. Uber and Lyft has made it great to a certain point, but also it can make it seem a little more dangerous because if you're like, oh, I get, I don't have to uh, drive home, so you know what? I'll have one or two more. And makes just it easier. It's yeah. so much easier than what it used to be because all you literally all you have to do is just hit a button on your cell phone. Yeah. And, and now you can just, you have that excuse. Um, and that's, that's very, very scary um, when it comes down to it. A question for you guys. When was the last time you have done one of these mega bottle shares that we used to do back years ago? And when I say mega bottle shares, I, man, there were nights that the three of us we're obviously with a group of say 10 people or 12 people, but it, it wasn't uncommon to open up 30, 40, 50 bottles some nights. And yeah, there's a leftover beer, but most of the time these are relatively high alcohol beers. And while we might not all have seemed like we were getting buzzed, I, I can only imagine how inebriated we were getting back then i haven't done a mega bottle share which by the way i'm inviting you guys over to the house to do a mega bottle share um <laughs> in a very long time I, I and and it's i just look back at it and i'm like man i would rather probably open 10 bottles and really enjoy those 10 bottles than try and fly through 50 uh i'm i'm thinking the last time i recall some sort of mega bottle share like that was prop like probably one that I did that was with uh I I, I remember I did an all sour one. Was wasn't your Hunapu Zukov thing after that? Oh, you know what? Yeah, that uh that was that was probably the last one I was at was yeah. at your old place the Hunapu Vertical with Zukov Vertical. What a great idea, by the way. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, yeah that that. That was after the the sour one, but you know, a lot of those people who uh, I knew when we were doing stuff like that, I, I either don't know anymore or they're not into doing stuff like that anymore either. So it, it's, it's a partial of like, 
the influence to do that is not there anymore. And also the desire to do that is not there anymore. So it's a little bit of both for me. Also consider the lack of availability. I mean, we were doing lots of bottle shares when this was what everyone called a beer wasteland. So yeah, a lot of true. us were trading. A lot of us were looking to collect stuff and then share it with our friends. Um, you know, the, the selection at various stores was probably less than half of what it is now. And, you know, every time there was some new release, it was a big deal. Now the market is so saturated, there's just tons of beer everywhere. So it doesn't seem like it's something we necessarily have to do all the time. I mean, it's, I, Mike, I think yours was probably the last one I've done as well. Plus, I just chalk it up to not get invited to shit anymore because people are probably sick of me. <laughs> it's amazing what kids do to you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, honestly. And it's funny looking at the bottle share photos and some of the bottle share photos are still people are trading and trying to grab things. But honestly, some of the ones that I'm the most intrigued about are the ones that are the products are on our shelf because I'm just not going to go out and buy 20 different cans of beer, or bottles of beer. And the bottle share community is truly probably the number one culprit behind the death of the 22 ounce 750 milliliter bottle in this industry. I'm all about the 16 ounce canned beer because I can actually drink that myself. Uh, you know, also, when's the last time any of you made a mixed six pack? Like, Phil, you mentioned, Shit. like, you don't have the ability to try, like, 20 new beers. Uh, like, that was have probably, you made a mixed six-pack? Yeah, that was probably, like, a month ago, two months ago, because there were so many seasonals out that I wanted to try, and new, just year-round beers that I was like, oh, well, I'm just going to make a six-pack and walk out. Now, that said, I did check the date codes pretty uh, extensively before I threw them into my mix sick. Mix six, sorry. But yeah, I I actually like the mix six because I can toss it in my refrigerator. Actually, it was my uh I bought a mix six of those NA beers that I drank on the oh, yeah, uh, right. podcast that so less than a month ago. So probably once a month I'm going right back to a mix six just to try and you know, I I've walked past it in an aisle probably now twelve times and I've said every time next time I see that I'm gonna buy it. Life and Limb Volume 3 in a 16-ounce can? Absolutely. I want to try it. Still haven't purchased it. So It's been a long time for me. I tried to put one together when I was in North Carolina in August, and everything was just out of code and warm as hell. Yeah, I, I honestly do not remember the last time that I, I made a mix sick. Uh, and I used to do that weekly. Uh many years ago like a decade ago um it's kind of great it's it's a little off topic but uh when you mentioned the bottle share thing it, it made me think of that we could do a mega bottle share with only shelf turds <laughs> all out of code stuff or do they have to be in code i don't know i think that's what the kids say or they they call beers that you can find on the shelf shelf turds so i was just trying to be hip and cool you you did a decent job of looking hip and cool <laughs> Thanks. Don't don't let anyone tell you otherwise. But yeah, this is um, if you're in the industry, I, I'm I'm sure that there's people outside of the industry who are thinking stuff like this. Who the fuck cares if I if I go get fucking sloshed at an event and uh, some brewery guy sees me? I mean, hopefully your your boss at your real job doesn't, and uh, uh, because they drink craft beer too, and they happen to be at the same event, but. I guess this is a little more geared towards people in the industry who have uh, a little more easy access to uh, consumption of beer. Um, any any kind of parting words that anyone has uh, for maybe recommendations or food for thought? Uh, don't succumb to the peer pressure. There's no listen. If you don't want another drink, tell somebody to go fuck themselves. Like you have, you know. I know it sounds selfish, but you do have to worry about you. You've got to get home safely. You got to get home alive. Don't embarrass yourself. Don't overdo it. You know, I believe me, I've embarrassed myself on many occasions. And although they make for some good stories sometimes, it, you know, that's not how I want people remembering me. And, um, you know, just, just, just be mindful and, and stay safe and take care of yourself. Yeah. If you do think that you have a problem and, and 
be it you're drinking too much or you have a dependency problem, don't hesitate to reach out to places, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, you can reach them at uh, 212-870-3400 or even a national uh, helpline number for um, alcoholics uh, and alcoholism at 844-289-0879. There's meetings and, you know, it, it, this isn't the sexy part of the podcast, but go out and get help. Make sure that you're always looking at yourself uh, being the best person that you can be. And if you do think that you have a problem, there's nothing wrong with that. You can go and you can get some help. Uh, very good information. Thanks, Phil, for for putting that out there too. Maybe maybe that'll help someone. That's awesome. But yeah, I, I think we'll wrap things up there. Uh, we'll move on to uh, last calls, our, our little moment in the show where each one of us gets to have some unspecified time to rant, rave, or just uh, soapbox f- uh, for a little bit about something unopposed. And uh, we'll start things off with Joel here. All right. Well, uh, this probably won't please a friend of the show, Ed, uh, because it discusses some positive attributes of uh, some of his competition in the retail world of alcohol. But uh, I did visit the brand newly remodeled ABC Liquor down in my neck of the woods up here in West Boca and um, super impressed. Uh, The whole store just blew me away. Uh, there is probably 99% of the beer in cold storage. Everything is in a reach-in or there's even sort of a bigger kind of walk-in that you can go into for larger cases. And there were only a couple of shelves or a couple of dry shelves rather. Uh, I was very impressed by that. That store used to be where beer would go to die and I just stopped shopping there. It was so out of code, room temperature, just just dying beer everywhere. So it was really great. I don't know, you know, if it was, you know, consumers that prompted them to move toward almost all cold storage, but it was really encouraging to see, and I hope more places follow suit. Um, and uh, got, that's where I found my celebration that I was chasing around all over town yesterday. Also got myself a big-ass jug of the Evan Williams eggnog, which I can't wait to put in my Marty Moose glass for the holidays. Uh, got some Jameson, got some wine for my wife, got some uh, some Baileys. I mean, I, I like I if my wife and kids weren't in the car waiting for me, I probably would have spent like two hours in there just buying shit and building up my own liquor cabinet at home. So uh, just, you know, shout out to those guys for the cold storage and, and taking care of the beer. It was really great to see for once. Awesome. Um, I'll give a, a quick shout out here to the NCAA finally deciding that let's talk about allowing athletes to profit off of their names and likeness. This is a long time coming. It's not in effect as of yet, but thank God that these kids can finally make some money off of their name that the NCAA has been making money off of their names uh, through video game rights and jerseys and so much shit for so long. Um, It's really bullshit that they have had to uh, be suspended and not do the thing that they enjoy doing just because they wanted to make some money off of people talking about them. Uh, So good on them for finally getting with the times and uh, wanting to go down that route. That was a great news story, by the way. I, I sort of alluded to it earlier. I used to be the old man sitting on my front lawn uh, yelling at people, hey, it's not Christmas yet. Don't put your Christmas tree up until after Thanksgiving. I put my Christmas tree up today. Um, super excited about it. It feels good. I sat in the car yesterday. We, we're in a cold snap right now in Florida. I think it got down to like 80. Um, and... I was like, man, it feels like winter. It, it this just it feels right, and so the trees up, everything's exciting. Um, you know, regardless of what holiday you celebrate, or if you don't celebrate a holiday at all, this is a magical time of the year. Please don't ruin it for somebody else. Very well said, Phil. Do you want to plug anything? Um, no. I uh, you know, LinkedIn, uh, MySpace. Uh, uh, I'm 
I'm on Spotify if anybody wants to follow me over there. What's your uh, username? Uh, I think it's on my Facebook account. I don't know, Phil Palmasano, somewhere in there. Follow me. Have fun. Uh, Joel, anything to plug? I am Florida D U H Brewer at uh, on Twitter, Instagram. Uh, come see me and Mike at West Palm Brewery. We are kicking ass lately, making shit. I think we're putting out like one brand new beer a week, uh, making some really awesome stuff. We just dropped a bunch of Berliners, all different sort of fruited treatments, and a uh, new kick ass Imperial Stout and a coffee treatment of that. So we got a lot of good shit coming on. Uh, so come hang out. Yeah, uh, I will uh, double up on uh, saying uh, this coffee imperial stout is dope. I love it. Shared a crowler with a friend of the show, Kevin, last night. He really enjoyed it. The Berliners are tasting awesome. Um, uh, You can follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Mike Loves Beer. You can follow the show on uh, social media as well. We're on Twitter at United We Drink. Instagram at United We Drink Pod. You can like us on Facebook. The next episode, we're going to talk about uh, what to expect getting into the industry. I think that's a kind of a, 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 a nice segue from what we were talking about here, already being in this the industry and, uh, and getting into consumption. So we're going to take a step back and talk about how we got into the industry and what the ex- expectations can be for someone who might be trying to get into the industry. You can listen to the podcast on uh, many different uh, platforms out there, such as our website, unitedwedrink.com. We're also on all of the major podcast apps, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, and iHeartRadio. We have brand new mini episodes every other week coming out in between these new main episodes where we do some Q&A. We we talk maybe a little bit about rehashing the previous episode, and we each get a, a... a week every now and then to put out a Spotify playlist. Uh, I had one last week. Uh, Joel is going to be next week with a brand new uh, playlist. Uh, You can subscribe to that on the same exact feed. So please do so. Buy a shirt, sticker, a button at unitedwedrink.com slash store and help support the show. Uh, Otherwise, we'll see you guys next week for a brand new mini episode. And then in two weeks, we'll talk about what to expect getting into the industry. Thanks again, everyone. See you then. Peace. Hail Satan. Seltzer. 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 Here's the West. Seltzer. 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 Seltzer.